Welcome to Training Unleashed, the show that will help you design and deliver training that's off the chain and will make a difference. Now, here's your host, Evan Hackle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what I think is going to be one of our best episodes ever on Training Unleashed. First, let me start off and thank C-Suite Radio and C-Suite TV for being an amazing support. Today, we have two great people, and they're with a company called Just Work, and the author of Just Work, Kim Scott, is with us, and the CEO of Just Work, Trier Bryant, is with us. And I... First off, I am just a huge fan. I just finished the book. I've read her other book, Radical Candor 2. Uh, as you know, we don't get into biographies. We just get into things here, but her background is exceptional. And this book, when I read it, I'm like, what does this title mean? And then when I got into it, I went, oh my God, this is so hot because they're talking about diversity, inclusion in real world terms, which I've never really seen before. If this is a book I really recommend everybody read in the world because it will change lives. So I'm going to start off with a softball question. Did you realize you were actually doing something that could change the world when you decided to write your book? You know, I started to write the book uh, mostly because I had a conversation with someone who I cared about. So Radical Candor had come out. Radical Candor is a book about feedback. And if you write a book about feedback, you're going to get a lot of it. So here was some that I got. I was at a company, a tech company in San Francisco, giving a presentation. And the CEO of the company afterwards pulled me aside and said, Kim, you know, she's one of, she's, she had been a colleague of mine for many years and one of too few black women CEOs in tech or any other sector, frankly. And she pulled me aside and said, Kim, I really love this idea of radical candor. It's gonna help me build the culture that I want, but I gotta tell you, it's a lot harder for me to put it into practice than it is for you, because as soon as I give anybody, even the most compassionate criticism, I get signed with the angry black woman stereotype. And she said, and I'm just gonna guess that it's harder for you to put it into practice than it is for the men who we work with. And furthermore, I, I realized like three things at the same time. The first was that she was exactly correct. I had not been the kind of upstander that I wanted to be. I had refused to notice the things that were happening to her. I had also been in denial about the things that were happening to me. And probably worst of all, I had been in denial about my failure as a leader to create the kind of environment in which this nonsense that I talk about in Just Work, and it really is just BS, that happens all the time, prevents us all from doing our best work, why those things happen and what, what should I have done as leader to prevent them from happening. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the origin story of Just Work. Well, that's, that's really cool. Triar, how did you get involved and what inspired you about Just Work? Well, um, I had been a fan of Radical Candor. I actually spent, I graduated from the Air Force Academy and I spent seven years active duty as a combat veteran. And when I first read Radical Candor, I was like, this is it. This is how we talk about feedback in the military. All non-military civilians read this book, right? And so I think it's an incredible tool for all leaders to have in their toolkit. So Kim, when Kim shared her new book, a pre-copy of it, an early edition, and I read it, um, I was just incredibly blown away by the simplicity and the practicality of the framework. And what was interesting, Evan, is that when I read the book, the great thing about the, the Just Work framework is that your own stories bring it to life. Like stories illuminate the framework and bring it to life. And it really forced me to sharpen my own perspective of my own experiences. And in particular, we'll get into the framework in a little bit, but when we talk about bullying, Kim's framing of bullying made me really realize that like, I, I had been bullied in my career, but I never thought if you would have asked me like, Trey, have you ever been bullied in your career? I'd be like, no, have you met me? Like you come for me, I'm going to come for you. Right. <laughs> and then I read this book and it was like, oh my gosh, like I have been bullied and I've never stood up for myself. I've never reacted to it because I couldn't name it in that way. And so if you can't name it, then like, how do you solve for it and, and fix it? Um, and so I just think that in the DEI space, we don't have a lot of frameworks to add to our toolkits. And so I was like, Kim, we have to get this into every organization and to every leader as, as quickly as possible. 
Yeah. And kids. Yes. Kids uh, read this book. We talk about that as well. We talk about, you know, what does this look like in other spaces, like even outside of the workplace, but it, there's just so many, you know, very tactical and practical things that you can do that are effective in the workplace, um, you know, but then also outside of the workplace and even for kids. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. A bunch of people who've read the book have written me and said, could you please write like a PG-13 version of the book? Because <laughs> I want to give this to my daughter, but I'm not sure I want to give this to my daughter yet or my son. Yeah. Um, you know, that's actually a kind of a cool thing because you practice radical candor in your book, in your new book. <laughs> I you, try to. You, no, you, you were, you were very honest and, um, and I, I think that was refreshing uh, as, part, as part of the work. And for me, I started thinking about the book because I, I like to consider myself evolved and, you know, yeah. very much. And then, you know, think about, you know, how have I been? Have I been perfect? And, and the answer is no. And then I started thinking about it. And, and I, I realized there were times that pe- things happened to me in the workplace. I mean, I've had uh, men come on to me in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had female customers hit on me in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I pretty much smiled and ignored it. <laughs> Which, <laughs> the way we all do. Right. But that, but that is not what causes change. Yeah. Um, what's really cool today is listening to us are people that day to day, their roles are, how do you make the workplace a safe environment for everybody. Yeah. So we're now going to shift into practical ideas in the workplace to support creating a safe environment, uh, to train people, up people's knowledge and understanding of what diversity and inclusion really means. Because I think a lot of people just think it's PC and yeah, and and it's not. And it's it's you know as you say in, in your book, it's about making the company better. Yeah, Uh, that's ultimately what's really important. Yeah, and I think the place to begin, at least the place I found most helpful to begin as I was writing the book and thinking about the different things that had happened to me over the course of my career is that very often we can conflate three different problems, bias, prejudice and bullying. So bias, I'm going to define as not meaning it. Prejudice, I'm going to, it's sort of an unconscious thing. Prejudice, I'm going to define as meaning it. This is a conscious belief. And bullying is being mean or meaning harm. And I think that each of these, each of these behaviors causes real problems in the work, in the workplace, but we've got to, we've got to respond to each differently. So I can talk about how to respond to them as an upstander or as a person harmed, and maybe Trier can give us some thoughts about what leaders can do. Uh, so in, in the case of bias, the best response I have found is an I statement, which sort of invites the other person in to understand things from your perspective. I don't think you're going to take me seriously when you're referring to me as pretty girl, for example, uh, which has happened to me. And, but in the case of, in the case of prejudice, it's not, you need to make the line between one person's freedom to believe whatever they want, but they can't do or say whatever they want. You got to make that line clear, especially in the workplace. And so, so you want to appeal to the law with an, you want to use an it statement to respond to prejudice and you, and, and an it statement can appeal to the law. It can appeal to HR policy, or it can appeal to common sense. So, for example, Trier had a a story about a time when she was interviewing, she was on an interview committee, and the most qualified person was a black woman who was wearing her natural hair out. And the hiring manager was refusing to hire this person, saying, and she said quite explicitly, we can't put that hair in front of the business. So that is prejudice. That was like she was justifying. And so what would an it statement in that case look like? It could be, it is illegal not to hire someone because of their hair, at least in the state of California, it is and a bunch of other states in this country. You could also- Unless it affects food or safety. Yes. In a restaurant, you've got to wear, I 
and Eddie, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, but you but, but you wear a net. You don't tell right, you know. Right, right. You, you don't, don't tell, tell somebody the how they have to cut their hair, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's fine. Uh, so it is illegal, or you could say it is a violation of our HR policies not to hire someone, or you could use common common sense. It is ridiculous not to hire the most qualified candidate because of her hair. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, so those are the it statements, the kinds examples of it statements you can use in the case of, of, of prejudice. But in the case of bullying, you want to use a you statement, either whether it's directed at you or whether you're the upstander. And a you statement sort of, unlike an I statement, which invites the person in, a you statement pushes the other person away. So you can't talk to me like that. Or what's going on for you here? If that, and, and I learned this actually, you were speaking about kids. I learned this from my daughter who was getting bullied and I was sort of advising her to use an I statement. I feel sad when you, and she banged her fist on the table and she said, mom, he was trying to make me feel sad. Why in the world would I tell him he succeeded? And I realized that's a really good point. So, so that's a sort of very simple things you can do when, when bias, prejudice or bullying are directed at you or when you observe them as an upstander. But what are the things that leaders can do to make sure that we change the default to silence. Because usually, as you said, when this stuff happens to you, you sort of smile and pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Trier, if, if you were in charge of HR for a company and training, what things and practices, what types of things would, pe would you recommend people implement? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of, talk around what should happen, but I think that people need very tactical tools that they can easily reference um, that organizations can roll out. So when we're talking about bias, um, a lot of times, you know, if someone doesn't mean it, then there's probably other folks in the room that don't understand it or, or can pick up on it as well. And so we have to interrupt the bias. So what we call, we call these bias interrupters. And bias interrupters, what's really important with this is to not only have a shared vocabulary, but a shared norm of what happens when someone is going to interrupt the bias. So it could be a word, a phrase, an action that when a person on the team or the company does it, everyone knows, oh, they're flagging bias, like what just happened? Um, you know, Kim gives uh, examples in the book saying like, hey, biased alert, right? Um, we have, we, we are teaching a course right now and we have a purple flag. And so you throw a purple flag, you know, just say purple flag, we have physical flags that we're sending <laughs> to those that are joining us in the course. And when someone says purple flag, everyone knows, hey, they're flagging a behavior or an attitude that was just bias or something that someone said. But then what's the shared norm that everyone understands happens afterwards? And so maybe it's just like, hey, thanks for flagging that. Um, appreciate you flagging that. I'll do a better job and then move forward to get to continue doing the work. But what happens if you don't understand, right? So saying like, hey, I'm not quite sure what you flagged, but let's connect after the meeting and have a conversation because we do still need to, you know, get things done. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing in the course, because it's over Zoom, which is such a, a great platform to do this, is that someone can in the chat actually throw a purple flag um, and, and then drop a link or explain in the chat what the bias was. People can read it, but the meeting can still go on. We can still get the work done, right? Um, because it is a forum where we are learning, we will pause and we'll discuss. But again, we just need to interrupt it in that moment and make sure that there's a shared vocabulary and a shared norm of what happens. So everyone's on the same page. And it's not about calling someone out. You really want to call someone in, right? And creating that environment where you want to, like we all want to be open to this learning environment. Like Evan, I guarantee you that like Kim or I will throw a purple flag at least once <laughs> in this podcast. Like we, we always do. And, and it, it's just a learning moment and, um, and it is just, but it's, it's, it's this rapport and this creating this space where we want to get better, right? We, we don't want to do harm to others. And so we want to call those things out versus prejudice is a little harder, right? Prejudice is harder um, because it is someone has that belief. And so what organizations need to do to set their folks up for success to really have to like, to be able to mitigate this is you have to have a code of conduct, right? Now it doesn't need to be called a code of conduct, but basically you need to have something with some teeth in it that holds people accountable, right? It draws that line in the sand to say, this is what we expect from your behaviors, your attitudes and how we engage and what's acceptable and what's not. So that when you see attitudes and behaviors outside of that, 
you can point to that and say, this is not acceptable. And so we need that code of conduct um, that people can point to and that organizations can point to. And I've seen great examples and then some examples that fall short. Um, you know, some organizations have really great values that do that, but not just values that stand alone, but then also what are statements under those values that people understand, like how, how do you bring those values to life and show up at an organization? So at one company, we had six values and none of the values were over three words, but under each value and everyone knew those values, but maybe what everyone didn't memorize is there were we statements. There was three we statements for every value that really helped people understand what it means to like, if we say, you know, um, people first, right? If that's a value, then what does that mean? That means that we respect people and we communicate respectfully. And like, there's the we statements that go with it. And then with bullying, and I will say as a, as a previous chief people officer and who have you know been responsible for this, this is the hardest. This has been the hardest in my career um, because what organizations, what leaders and organizations need to do is to provide consequences. And that can be challenging, right? But we talk about three different con three types of consequences in the framework. We talk about um, conversational consequences, which is like, how do you remove that platform for someone to continue bullying and causing harm? Um, the second is uh, co compensation consequences, right? We shouldn't be increasing this person's base salary or giving them a bonus, um, you know, people care about that money. And so, you know, just making sure that we're sending the message that this is a consequence for your behavior and actions, right? And then the third is career consequences. Like, are we promoting the brilliant jerk? Are we making them a, a manager and a leader so they have direct reports? Are we promoting them? Uh, and, and the hardest consequence is that if we can't get change behavior, you gotta get rid of that person within the organization. And that can be hard, especially in smaller organizations where you don't have a lot of redundancy. And it's like, well, we can't get it done because that one person does that one job and it's so critical to the organization. Um, but it's something that we definitely, leaders have to put in place consequences because bullying only works for the bully. So I love what you guys said, and I'm gonna recap for everyone listening because I think there's some really key things here. One is our language matters and that we need to think about how we're saying things in very powerful ways. The next is that organizations need to have a way in which people can let people know they see bias in a fun way so that it is okay to let people know because otherwise it, it would come off as confrontive, but you're using the purple flag, um, not for bias, but for other things. Uh, I've you know, worked with you know, people where, you know, like if they say an opinion, like it's a fact, you know, people lift up a glass just as an indication that because it, it this is, has nothing to do with this topic, because it when someone states a, an opinion like a fact, it really stifles conversation because it doesn't enable other people to share their opinion without like implying the other person's wrong. Um, and then then what I heard is you have to have real clarity of what's accepted and what's not accepted. Um, and it can be in the form of values, or it could be a code of conduct, or some other mechanism, but people really need to know. And then you started talking about consequences. And this is the area that I think is the most difficult area. When you have somebody who's like your number one salesperson, that person that's indispensable in that role. And, that's right. And I find in my experience, you guys don't know me, at one time I ran a $5 billion company, which is nothing compared to Kim, but anyhow, <laughs> um, the, the, I find that when, I, when the organization finally gets rid of that person, what you hear is like momentous. It's like the iceberg where only 10% showing and then you see the whole iceberg. In your, in your book, Kim, you talked about a manager who passed over a better qualified woman because they thought that the man would leave. And it was really, it was really biased, maybe prejudiced. I, you know, there's a fine line here. And then, you know, eventually that woman left and took all these people with. So if you could just talk for a moment about the real cost of, to the organizations, because this is what I think you really did well in your book is this isn't PC, this is about 
just work. This is about making your place of business more effective. Yeah, and I, I think all of these bias, prejudice, and bullying are going to cost you. They're, they're, not only will they harm people in your organization, they're, they're going to prevent the team's ability to collaborate, and they're going to they're going to create a great cost. And bullying, I think, is one of the behaviors that has well, all of these costs are somewhat hidden, but especially bullying. So, so in, in the example that I described in the book, what happened was the, this woman's manager deci decided that she would stay because she was loyal to the company. And, and he was afraid the man would leave. He also thought she wasn't technical enough, which is a very common, <laughs> common thing that, that women face, especially in the tech industry. And it turned out that she went on to become the chief product officer at a super fast growing company and to be one of the great technical leaders in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and so he looked in the end quite foolish. It was very bad for the company that she left because they lost great talent and, uh, in her and, and her skills. And they also lost a number of people who followed her who thought, gosh, if she can't make it here, you know, I as a woman have no cho no chance, so I better get out while the getting's good too. And so the cost to an organization of 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 not noticing someone, the, and the the problem was that the guy who got promoted ahead of her was kind of a bully. He was, the, and his manager was making the he was making some gendered and biased assumptions. So it was sort of like almost unconscious discrimination not to promote her. But he was also rewarding the bully for his bullying behavior, and uh, and it was it was bad. It was bad all no matter how you slice it. It was bad. So I think just to recap, I would say bias. You need you need these. You need to interrupt the bias. Prejudice. You need a code of conduct. And bullying. You need these real consequences for bullying. Yeah, that 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 makes that makes total sense. You know, as you were sharing, I just shared this story of of bias and is back in the early 80s, I was in the floor covering business and we would train female saleswomen that very early on in the presentation to talk about the technical aspects of the floor covering so that the customer felt they, they, they knew more than fashion. And yeah. we would teach the men to talk about fashion and color coordination so that the, that the customer would feel they knew more than just the technicalities of how flooring was built yeah. um, <laughs> to, to deal with it. And, and I'm not sure if at that time it was bad advice because your, your customers have bias too, but it does you know, reinforce a stereotype. And I guess this leads me now into the, into the, the question of, um, you see it, you get it, you both get it. And I'm going to go to you, Trier, but sometimes it's so hard for the people in the organization to see it because they've been taught from being a little kid and self-ingrained and people don't see themselves. How do you, how do you get your company to really not just put lip service, but to make it a core part of their being? Yeah. And that wasn't an easy question, but I, I know you can handle no, it. We get, the, we get the question often, right? And people talk about, oh, it's, it's so hard and it's difficult. But, and so a couple of perspectives on that is, um, oftentimes we get that question from folks who are not in the position of being harmed. And so what I ask them to reflect on is like, if you think it's hard to solve this problem, to do better at it, imagine how hard it is to be in the workplace where you're constantly the person who's being harmed and you carry that as you're trying to just work and get things done, right? Um, and so we all have to, we have to carry the load and we all have to do our part to overcome this workplace injustices because everyone just deserves to come into these organizations and do their best work with all, all the noise and the things that just make it more challenging. The second part is, is that, you know, people talk about change a lot, but change happens over time. Um, and, and you look up, I think the, the, the one that I was recently reflecting on is 
I remember when I was a kid, everyone smoked. Everyone smoked. Everyone in my family, like everyone just smoked. It was like one of those things where it's like, like when you're an adult, you just start buying cigarettes and you smoke, right? And now I only know one person and they are like an older, older like aunt that smokes. And I don't know anyone that smokes cigarettes, right? It's just like, it's so taboo. Um, and we took measures to change that and behaviors changed. And now, you know, you don't see all the designated smoking areas and all this stuff, right? Um, and it's interesting how that I feel like that just kind of changed in the background, but we did put in efforts, you know, there was regulation and so forth. So like we can as a society make changes when we choose to and we commit to it when, when it's something that we value. And it's just very clear that this is an area where we don't value. But what I think is important is that this is a moment in time with everything that has happened from, you know, last year with the Black Lives Matter right now in this moment with, you know, stop Asian hate, like something has to change. And we all need to do our part together to, to get to get through that. And um, it starts, I think, in our personal lives, but also professional lives. And so I would just encourage folks to do the work and to reflect on like, what is my part in this and what can I do? Um, you know, we just had a, a fast, a fast company just highlighted an excerpt from the book, just talking about being an upstander. Right. And so even if it's just, what does that mean? Like if nothing else, go read that article, go read that chapter in the book and learn how to be an upstander. I think that we all have a responsibility as colleagues and coworkers to learn and understand how to be an upstander for others that we work with. I think also this, the, if we start with bias, so we talked about bias, prejudice, and bullying. And then when you layer power on top of that, you get discrimination, harassment, and physical violations, including violence. And the path from bias to violence is unfortunately well-worn and well-known. And that's why, that's a big part of the reason why we have to change it. But that doesn't mean that treating bias as though it were violence is the right way to respond to it. And so one of the things we need to do when we're talking about bias is, is to be patient with ourselves and to keep trying and, and, and not to be too hard on ourselves when we, when we make the same mistake. It's hard to change your language. So for example, as I was writing the book, I worked with a, a wonderful person named Breeze Harper, who was sort of my bias buster. She read the book and she pointed out language I used that was going to harm people. And one of the words that she pointed out was the way that I use the word see is, is ableist. It, 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 I, when I mean understand or when I meant notice, I would use the word see, which would imply that someone who's blind doesn't understand or doesn't notice. And of course, that's not true. And I know that's not true. And I was glad she pointed it out. And I was glad for two reasons. As you, as you said before, Evan, this is, there's a justice element to this, and then there's a practical element. And so one of the reasons why I was so glad she pointed it out is that another one of the editors, Zach Shore, is a wonderful editor. He's a historian, a great writer, and he's also blind. And the last thing in the world I, I really care about Zach, and the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to use language that was going to harm him. Uh, and I also, I'm a writer, like I, words matter to me, and I care a lot about using the right words. So it was, uh, there was a practical element as well. So I really thought, I thanked Breeze for pointing this out, and I really thought I had solved the problem. I thought I was aware of it, and it turns out awareness is not enough. So, so I decided I better do a check. I better measure, I talk in the book about quantifying your bias. I better measure how many times I, I use, so I did a search in the book, and I think I've pulled out all these sloppy site metaphors. And in 350 pages, 99 times I had used a sloppy site metaphor, 99 times wow. after I thought I had become aware and had fixed it. And so that's why the purple flag is important. I, I, will, I will make the same mistake more than once, and it's frustrating to have to correct somebody's, but we've got to sort of, we, we've got to we've got to lighten it up when we're correcting bias a little bit so that we can so that we will continue correcting it. Whereas with with bullying, we really need to create consequences. So that's part of the reason why it, that's part of the reason why it's important to distinguish between these different attitudes and behaviors so that we can respond in the most effective way. Okay, I'm talking to two superstars. 
you haven't put up a purple flag, but you're probably being polite. What have I said that would be a purple flag? Because I generally want to know. And I also think this kind of curious behavior based on everything you've said is part of the solution. So what bias things have I said? I've got two. Excellent. One was you used the word C in the same word, same way I did, which okay. is why I told that story. Actually, it was a subtle purple flag. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's one. I think the other one, and this is something I've done a lot too. You were sort of helping your, your sales reps to navigate around bias from customers, which is sort of Trier and I have talked a lot about this. I think we we got a lot of advice and it was like it helped us succeed in our careers about navigating around problems in the workplace. But I think we've come to a place where now it's time to teach people how to confront it more head on so that we can change it instead of having to navigate around it. So with the training, uh, to tell if, if the customers are sort of saying biased things to the women or assuming that the women aren't technical enough or that the men don't have empathy like let's just correct that head on with our customers in a friendly way of course yeah well i'm going to do what i think most people should do when they get a purple flag is thank you for pointing those things out because that's how i learn and how i get better um we're now going to shift to the end of of the podcast um first off um, uh, Trier, I, when I asked you about the workplace, I thought, oh, the perfect answer would be have everyone read the book <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, really, and, and, and Kim, I do this a lot and I'm not this unabashedly positive. If you listen to my podcast, you would know you are an excellent writer and it is a gripping book and it's an interesting book. And you have such a nice way of weaving stories as examples in your book. I do think it's, it's just a powerful book because it's not going to be kind of a book that you, someone's going to get six pages in and not be able to turn the next page. Well, um, thank you. You know, you just, you made four long, lonely years sitting, sitting in the shed <laughs> in my backyard worthwhile. So I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Uh, Trier is the CEO of Just Works. I know that your company is more than a book. And who are the kind of clients that you like and what kind of work do you do? Uh, maybe some of the people in the audience would be the right fit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what Kim says, and she did this with Radical Candor as well, but unfortunately, you know, behaviors don't change just by reading a book, right? But and do read the book. But do read the book. <laughs> but I think that like, you know, I think that, I think that, though also from my perspective is that an organization doesn't change because one person read the book. And so it is, how do you really think about um, and, and what does it look like to really evolve an organization to get, you know, these change behaviors to be scaled across, you know, all of your talent and all of your employees. And so just work the company basically helps to take this theory from the book and put it into practice in your organization. And so, you know, we want to work with companies and organizations that you want to expose and educate your employees to the framework and give them that tool. But then maybe you also want to take it a step further and say, how do we really evolve and transform um, our organization? So, you know, we can come in and do a keynote, right? A, a keynote where we talk and we answer questions. Um, but then it's like taking that a step further is like, do you want all of your managers to go through a, you know, a six week course to really understand as leaders, how do you transform your team and your, and your organizations or doing various workshops or also coaching with executives? So there's a lot of different ways where we can engage, um, organizations of, you know, our different engagements and our, our capabilities and making this investment in your organization and in your people, because it's incredibly powerful and, and also necessary. Um, so yeah. So if anyone wants to reach out and you can find more information on our website, just work together.com. Excellent. And, and I just want to point out when a company makes that kind of investment, mm -hmm. It's what makes the change because people know the company's serious yeah. and they're not just talking. Yeah. 
And, and while I think that our keynote is exceptional, um, you know, thinking about a keynote and, and checking the box of like, how do you, it's one of those things where it's like, you have to continue to reinforce. I mean, people who work in learning and development and the people space, like we know that you have to reinforce with your employees. You have to repeat things several times in several different ways so that everyone, you have to meet people where they're at to get it. And so, you know, building out strategies and co-creating that with clients is something that, you know, we, we are doing and we're very excited to continue to do um, because I think it's truly important. I don't think it's a, an, I don't believe in like, it's a plug and play strategy for any organization. You really have to meet companies where they're at, understand the culture and what works for them. Excellent. So you guys have like an innovative offer. No one's ever given an offer like this away. Evan, I'm going to throw a purple flag. Are you ready? Go on ahead. Okay, so this one is a, a really big heavy run, but let me guess. Guys. I said you guys, yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, guys. As soon as you said flag, I got oh my god. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And it's easy for me to fix this because I grew up in Memphis, so it's natural for me to say you all. My I still have not taught my children. Yeah, y'all. Folks, folk. That's a hard one to break. It is. It is, and I appreciate you mentioning it because that's how you break it. And now I get to have a conversation with my family. <laughs> Evan, let me it. tell you, um, so I was working with someone with one of our uh, clients and it was uh, it was uh, one of the executives on the, on the leadership team. And it was really, really hard for them to, to break that. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, and so I started to refer to the team, which was all men as gals. And I'd be like, hey gals, let's get started. <laughs> and Everyone would always just, and I would say, do you see how that feels, right? And it's just like, so, and and, and he was like, Trier, I get it. And he, and he was like, so now every time I'm about to say it, I just think about if someone were to be like, hey, gals, hey, gals, right? No, no, no I just mean it to be gender neutral, but, you know, <laughs> um, and I go, oh, well, I mean, hey, gals, to be gender neutral, right? Hey, gals, let's get started. Let's go, gals. Gals, what did you think of that, of that presentation, of that video? So just sharing that with you. I love that. Wonderful company has a very unique <laughs> offer and one that has never been presented before, but please share and let everyone know about the offer. So one of the things that I love uh, now that this book is out there in the world is, is hearing stories from other people. I told a lot of my stories. This morning I was on Minnesota Public Radio and a bunch of people called in and told their bias stories, their prejudice stories, their bullying stories. And we talked about how they dealt with it, how they wish they had dealt with it, how they could have dealt with it differently. And it, it felt very healing. So one of the things we have on our website is, is a section where you can tell us your story. And then we're figuring out how to create really community around these stories because I think this is part of how we both learn and heal and kind of enjoy each other. We get to know each other. There's something about this that, that feels like a reward, not a punishment to tell these stories. That I think is super cool. And we're at the end of the show, but we always end with the question, what is, if you had one tip, what would that one tip be? Well, mine would be go out and invest in this 25 cent purple flag. It's it's the best investment and, and work with your team to what's the shared language like Trier said that that you're going to use to flag bias. Is it are you just going to wave the flag? Are you going to say bias alert? What, what are you going to say and get people? You're never going to make people comfortable saying, but get people feel that it is their duty to say it, to wave the purple flag. And then teach people, as Trier said, how to respond, just like you did, uh, Evan, it, when, when, when you said, thank you, I, I get it. Or if you don't understand, say, thank you for pointing it out, but I don't get it. Explain it to me after the meeting. Uh, and I think that will make a huge difference. So yes. I know there's a little story behind the color purple. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you share that? Because I think that would be good. Because most people would think of a red flag. Yes. Uh, purple, because it's the color of the book, uh, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the color of my t-shirt. I bought a bunch of these t-shirts to go with my book cover. The orange sweater goes with radical candor. That's all. Yeah. I like okay. orange. So that's, the, that's the, the, the match. Okay, that works. Well, I want to thank my two guests very much for being here. I want to thank my audience. I really, you know, would not be a show without you. 
Uh, I also want to thank my friends at C-Suite TV and radio for all your help and your support. Everybody have a wonderful day. Training Unleashed is brought to you by Tortal Training, specializing in e-learning and interactive online training solutions for corporate, government, nonprofit, and franchise organizations. Tortal makes effective training easier. Just go to tortal.net to gain access to real-world tools that can make a difference. That's tortal.net, T-O-R-T-A-L, tortal.net.